Welcome to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey, it's Debbie, and I am going to talk to fellow Canadian today, as I'm actually from Canada originally. Winnipeg, Manitoba is where I was born and lived in West Vancouver until I was 13 years old. (laughs) And then moved to Bellevue, Washington. Now I'm in North San Diego. So if you really want to know anything about where I'm from, (laughs) that is a side trivia about me. But today I'm talking to Alex, who's a CEO of a drink HRW. We're going to talk about hydrogen water and also an anti-aging supplement that they sent me that I totally interested in learning more as I somehow turned a 5-0 this November 2021. And I am uh, <laughs> doing everything I can to prepare myself for flipping over to the second half of my life. So let's bring on Alex as he just joined my waiting room. Hey guys, I've got Alex on the show. He's the CEO of Drink HRW, the hydrogen water tablet company. And we're gonna just dive deep into it. So Alex, thanks for coming on the show, fellow Canadian, welcome. Um, yeah. So what, what made you even you know, come up with the hydrogen water tablet companies and start this product to begin with. And we'll kind of explain what it is and what it does and how we can benefit from it. Sure. I'll, I'll give you the short version because I know we're, yeah. we're you know, on a, on a time crunch here. Uh, basically, I, I got really sick, um, you know, about six, seven years ago. Um, it was at a time when I was training six plus hours a day, six times a week with an active recovery day, you know, between martial arts and CrossFit and then hiking and, you know, road work and everything like that. Um, whatever I had, my inflammation was like 80 times usual. My, my C-reactive proteins, I, I had sudden onset narcolepsy, right? Um, I, I had central nervous system fatigue, like shut down. I couldn't, I couldn't get airtime. Like I couldn't jump like not even an inch off the ground. Um, it was really bizarre, but like my strength was normal. At the same time, my best friend and roommate at the time, he was a guy who like top hand in triathlons and, you know, Spartan races, stuff like that. Um, he missed like three weeks of work due to pneumonia and had to go to the hospital a couple, couple times. They didn't know what either of us had, but when the dust settled and whatever virus or whatever I had was gone, I was left with arthritis you know, and, and moderate arthritis in my left shoulder, right? So I went the, the, you know, traditional route, which I knew wasn't, you know, a long-term fix. And there is really no long-term fixes available for arthritis right now. And I was taking a thousand milligrams of naproxen, you know, it was a, a prescription version. So it, think Aleve, right? But like a super, super high dose. Um, and I was getting cortisone injections in my shoulder, but I knew that wasn't a forever type thing. So I was just searching for, what could regulate the inflammatory process and hydrogen pocket. I bought this machine that was like five thousand dollars, you know, started, you know, drinking hydrogen water. Um, and then after eight months or something, I, I developed a bunch of ulcers. And you know, from the naproxen, I just stopped and my shoulder froze, like completely froze within a matter of days. You know, made me frustrated. The the hydrogen water wasn't working. Um, I went back to PubMed and started reading more, looking for more things. Hydrogen water popped up several other times, like several more studies, which really frustrated me because it clearly wasn't working for me. But I started looking deeper into the methodology and looking at the concentrations and dosages that were, were you know, giving the results, looking at the rodent studies and what we're doing to the rodents and doing the, the conversions to humans. And I said, well, okay, this is the dose that's working, what dose am I getting, right? Because the salespeople who sold me the machine didn't tell me anything about concentration or dose or anything, right? So I measured the machine and it was like a negligible amount of hydrogen. I actually had to triple the input to measure any at all. So it was like 0.03 parts per million of hydrogen in the water. 
um, for context, our tablets deliver 12, you know, parts per million of hydrogen in the water. So, you know, so much, you know, so, so much more, right. And, uh, uh, like e even the minimum dose that's ever been observed to be effective is 0.5, right. So 0.03 to 0.5, it was just never going to be effective. And, that's when I just started really experimenting and, and uh, figuring out ways to do it myself. Started as a DIY project, but um, as it got bigger, as I hired, you know, a PhD, you know, medicinal chemist to, to start looking over my work to make sure I wasn't going to win a Darwin Award and kill myself, you know, um, that's when I started thinking, okay, well, this is working for me. You know, like my shoulder unfroze. I started hand pressing tablets for friends and family. Everyone was reporting like benefits, like you know, what they were saying. I'm like, the stuff seems to be working. The science is picking up. I I'm making this product that it is a hundred times better than anything on the market right now and cheaper. Um, and, uh, you know, th there seems to be a need for it. So that's when I kind of jumped all in and said, I'm going to commercialize this, right? I'm, I'm going to, you know, do this uh, as my next business. And, uh, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be because it only took us like three weeks to develop, you know, optimal prototypes that we could hand press making like 10, 50 tablets at one time, but then to go to scale and make millions, we had to go to the drawing board. It took over 2000 iterative adjustments, um, over a year and 15 failed scale up attempts in manufacturing before we got our first production ready tablet, which wasn't as good as our prototypes. And now, four years later, we're finally better than our prototypes, but we're probably at least 6,000 reserve adjustments, you know, and, and four more years of R&D. So um, it's ended up being a really big project, but that, that's, you know, the long middle version of, of how I got into it. Yeah, everyone has such a great story of their why. So I was like to start each show and asking our guests what's their why, because everyone there's a, gives you a purpose, something that happened to you and create this, you know, vision and this motivation and bring something to life or, you know, same with practitioners, we all have something to do with like why we want to help people get better. So hydrogen tablets, they come in a little, little tab, you just drop it in your water. So to walk us through how it works and, and how, when do we use it and why should we use it as athletes? Cause as I was telling you, we're I'm all focused about helping everyone being fit and healthy from the inside out. And what sure. we're doing, everyone's so for, focused on performance gains. I want people to focus on longevity. I keep writing lately. I want to focus on when I'm 65, 70 years old, am I still going to be biking and I'm going to be traveling the world and climbing the hills in Tuscany. So what I'm doing now is to prepare me for my older years in life. And I, mean, and I, I feel that because at 35 going on 36, I have a fraction of the ability and fitness as I did, you know, seven years ago, 10 years ago, I've got arthritis in 11 spots right now. You know, I, I've already had, you know, surgeries, you know, I need more. Um, and, and that was all a result of overtraining injuries, trying to push myself to perform at the highest level I could with no care of what it was going to do to me, you know, later on in life. Right. So, I've had a big mentality switch, you know, over the last several years regarding that. Um, so basically the tablets, they're, they're using um, a, a special non-ionic magnesium. So it's very different than the magnesium you buy off the shelf, right? So it, it's like the reactive earth metal, but it's not just as simple as that. We have a, a certain breakdown of particle shapes and sizes and acids so that it, it's safe and, you know, can react properly in the water. When you drop it in, it's splitting the H2 off the O, right, and the H2O. So what we're doing is we're creating this uh, cloud of nanobubbles of hydrogen. You know, then what ends up happening is the magnesium, you know, and the oxide all, all react, and then with the acids come together, that leaves just magnesium ions in the water as well. So there's pure hydrogen gas and magnesium ions. Now the benefit there is Magnesium ions is what we need in our body. Any magnesium supplement has to break down to be magnesium ions in our stomach. 
And most of them are very bad at doing this. Like magnesium oxide, which is the most common form you buy at the store, is only about 4% bioavailable. Our reaction in the water does all the work for you so your stomach doesn't have to. You know, so our magnesium is maybe 80 times as potent, you know, to get into your cells and your body as a magnesium oxide. So it looks like it's only 80 milligrams, but that means you're going to get all that magnesium into your body rather than, than causing GI distress and, you know, just working as a laxative like a lot of magnesium supplements will. So the reason why hydrogen is so beneficial and it's not just for athletes it's for longevity too when you look at, at our clinical research it's all over the map and, and it's for good reason why it's all over the map um i mean we've got hundreds of co-athletes taking our product we've got dozens who officially endorse us right um but also we have uh, clinical research ongoing looking at, at parameters of aging itself right we've reversed metabolic issues like metabolic syndrome and math will be you know in clinical trials you know, we have research on raising alertness after sleep deprivation. We actually have a, a phase three clinical trial underway right now in, in France um, for COVID-19. We have actually three trials underway right now for COVID-19, right? So there's a wide variety of things hydrogen can help with, and, and it comes down to evolution, right? Now, hydrogen has played an integral role, you know, in the development of our planet, of all life of our atmosphere even our mitochondria evolved from you know a, an organelle that that uh, was hydrogen dependent so it used hydrogen as its fuel source right that's how our mitochondria you know evolved right so hydrogen was, was integral in the evolution of our mitochondria now within our, our body our, our microbiome we have hydrogen producing bacteria and hydrogen consuming bacteria right so hydrogen is in our bodies at all times, um, you know, at, at basal levels. Now, it, it at first didn't make sense. We at first thought hydrogen played no role in physiology. It was just there and it was inert in nothing. Now we're realizing that's really not true. And, and there's two different things. Endogenous hydrogen, you know, is very important in what we produce in our body. But exogenous hydrogen is also very important. Um, you know, there could be multiple reasons for that. The oldest water sources we've ever found on the planet, one was um, on the Canadian, you know, shield, you know, billions of years old. All these ancient waters we're finding have dissolved hydrogen gas in them, right? Significant levels. Um, but on top of that, if you think about how we evolved through the paleo period, our hunter gatherer stage, um, we would have had intermittent access to different food sources, right? There would have been days we didn't eat, right? So we would have been generating no hydrogen at all because that's how we generate hydrogen in our body is breakdown of carbohydrates in our small intestine. Bacteria breaks down, you know, the, these carbs and it releases hydrogen as gas. So there would have been days where we'd have no hydrogen. Then there were days where we might have found a big source of, of fruit or grains or something like that, you know, and have this large access you know, of hydrogen being produced. Um, now we start looking at the research. Well, if you give a continuous dose of hydrogen, even if it's super high, you know, if, if we give hydrogen to, to say a mouse 24 seven, there are no health benefits. Now, if we give an intermittent acute high dose of hydrogen, we see all these benefits, right? There's been, you know, studies that explored both routes. Um, you know, we, we look at, uh, um, the, these, these small acute doses and we'll see that your cellular concentrations of hydrogen can double or more in a short amount of time. They might only double for five minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, but after that, we see all these changes in cell signaling, genetic expression, right? All, all these cellular communications change. Um, it, it's also, uh, very interesting that when we apply hydrogen gas to healthy cells, not very much happens. Very little happens. Now, if we damage these cells, then we see huge changes. And it's not as simple as hydrogen is working, say, like an antioxidant or an anti inflammatory, because it's not. You know, we'll see studies where hydrogen is, you know, in, like it, it's basically um, 
activating something called our NERF-2 pathway, and it, it's raising our own production of antioxidants, like glutathione, you know, sod, right, catalase, then other studies where it's actually raising oxidative stress. But in both scenarios, it, it's leading to something called the uh, homeostasis of our redox stats, right? So that's kind of the harmony between our, our you know, oxidative stress and, and our antioxidant system. Now we need oxidative stress in our body. You know, before we thought they were just damaging, right? But now we know certain, you know, oxidative and nitrosative stressors are super important, right? H2O2 is super important. I mean, nitric oxide is a free radical and oxidative or a nitrosative stress, you know, and, and the discovery of its role in the body, you know, in vasodilation and all these things won a Nobel Prize, right? So we know we need these stresses in ourselves. We just need the harmony, right? Between you know, the, the oxidative stress and the antioxidants. It's the same thing with inflammation, right? We think of inflammation as bad. Well, no, acute inflammation is part of our immune system, right? If you aren't producing inflammation, you're gonna get really sick if something happens to you or, or you're not gonna be protected if you get injured. It's chronic elevated inflammation, which is a problem. Hydrogen has shown both to, to lower or raise inflammation depending on the model, again, driving towards, um, basically an optimal inflammatory response, right? It, it's done the same thing with autophagy, right? In several models, it's activated autophagy for beneficial results. In other model, models, like models of say heart failure, it, it's blunted autophagy, which would have been very bad after someone had a heart attack, right? So I've started thinking about hydrogen as sort of um, kind of like a supervisor or regulator uh, of our cellular communication. Right, I, I give the analogy, say you have a factory and, and you're making shoes and you have one line that's making shoelaces, another line that's making the soles, another line making the insoles, another line you know, making the tongue, another making you know, the outer shell of the shoe. Well, those lines all have to operate in harmony, right? Even though you can say the line making shoelaces is good, if you're making too many shoelaces, they start to pile up and create trash and junk. Right, there's no harmony on the line. Um, and that's the same thing with, with so many functions in our body, right? They're good or bad depending on the harmony between all the other functions. And hydrogen seems to be coming in like a supervisor and saying, hey, slow down that line, speed up that line, right? And getting everything to work together harmoniously. That's with the whole body. I was, you know. Right, and to share that it's this harmony, as you're saying, it's this orchestra, and everyone has to be playing in sync to create this optimal sound, optimal performance. And it's that Goldilocks effect for almost everything in our body not too much, not too little, just that right amount, create that positive effect. And so many times, everyone thinks more is better. If this is good for me, I need more. And then you know, say more, too much of something can be toxic, too little is deficiency. It's just, what's the right amount? We, we and see that all the time with vitamins, you, you yeah. know what I mean? Like you can get the same side effects from vitamin toxicity as you do from deficiency, right? Yeah. From overdosing, right? Mm -hmm. For a lot of different vitamins, for antioxidants, people think antioxidants are good for you. Well, all of the studies in humans, large scale studies, most of them were stopped dead right? Like just cut off, stop recruiting people because we started finding out that high dose antioxidant therapy not only doesn't work, it causes harm, right? It increases all cause mortality. It, it increases risk of cancer. It interferes with cancer treatment, right? And that's, you know, before we really started to, to understand that these stressors in our body, these, these oxidative and nitrosative stressors play a role. They're important, right? So when we're just flooding our body with all these, you know, antioxidants that we take, you know, um, in high, high doses, it's doing two things. It's shutting down our body's own production of antioxidants, right? But, which are usually more effective. And it, it's, you know, getting rid of a lot of the good oxidative and nitrogen stressors, you know, which, which play a role. And most of them are completely ineffective at getting rid of the really bad damaging guys like the hydroxyl radical and peroxynitrile, right? That, that don't have a role that are just causing damage, right? So, you know, we, we can chalk that up to marketing, right? Marketing companies tend to fall to what's the easiest thing to say? What have other companies said? Well, 
Other companies say, you know, antioxidants are good. So we're going to say ours is the most powerful and it's a better antioxidant and you get more of it, you know, and, and that comes down to, to marketing and incorrect, incorrect perception, not what's good for the user. Yeah. And it's, it's timing of things too. People always think, yeah, I'm creating oxidative stress. Maybe they don't know when you exercise, <laughs> especially if you're going, you know, longer than 45 minutes, you're creating more oxidative stress. And so what do you do to improve that damage you're putting on your body with excessive exercise is all you read antioxidants, but it's not right after you work out. Cause you just said you want your own body's natural production of antioxidants to help that process. But then, you know, if it's later in the evening before bed or when you take them or do you need them or not? Well, and, and that, that's the thing. I mean, hydrogen and, uh, you know, exercise are both things we've evolved to expect and we've adapted to, right? They're stressors, which makes us stronger. It's something called hormones, right? You know, and, and you look at exercise. If you don't exercise at all, right, there's all these negative consequences right you know our, our body becomes not harmonious if you exercise too much there's the same negative consequences right because you're not giving your body time to adapt and grow stronger it would just it's stress 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 right that that is similar to hydrogen if you take it all the time say all you drink is hydrogen water you inhale it all day long you know it, it's not only not beneficial it's probably harmful right you know whereas taking these intermittent blasts is what's helpful. Now, what we've seen uh, both in, in animal and human research is taking hydrogen with exercise actually, you know, blunts the damages while potentiating the results, right? So in, in well-controlled rodent research, it'll show giving hydrogen during exercise is acutely raising oxidative stress. So it's as if they exercise harder than they did. However, it's then reversing and getting back to homeostasis faster than exercise alone. So it's like you've got more out of your workout and recovered quick. So the recovery and the pair is more efficient and faster to respond with the hydrogen water it, during workout. Not, not for say muscle growth or anything yeah. like that. I'm talking yeah. just about say regulation of, of you know, redox, you know, mm -hmm. inflammatory, all, all this stuff. Like, Within in our cellular communications, like the combo of hydrogen and exercise mm -hmm. seems to work complementary to each other. So, are you saying when if people you know hopefully go try this out, do we take it before a workout, during, or is it just like when you wake up in the morning we should have it afterwards? What are you? So I got it works best. different dosing protocols. You know that I recommend. Um, days I exercise, I do it right before I exercise. Um, other days, I might do it uh, first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. Um, other people like doing it, say, early mid-afternoon if they're feeling a lull. We've got uh, a couple of clinical trials on, on raising alertness after sleep deprivation. Actually, one that's uh, under peer review right now um, was hydrogen versus caffeine that showed hydrogen actually had a more um, robust effect on brain metabolism than caffeine did using fMRI. So that was pretty interesting to see. Yeah. Um, one thing that's important is I think that we need to change our routine yes. every three to six months. You know, just like exercise. If you the, exactly. If you do the same exercise every day forever, it stops being exercise. Right, your body. Adapts. I found that years ago. I was training for Ironman, and like, who would even know I'm working out 15, 20 hours a week? My body did it for so many years; it didn't change a thing. Yep. Uh, so, I typically like setting a routine for myself with hydrogen, and I'll do it for three to six months, and then I'll wash out for a week, don't mm -hmm. take any, and then I change my routine. Good. Right, take it at yeah. a different dose at a different time of day. Yeah. I always think of it as working out as muscle confusion, you know, just mixing things up all the time. Same with your routine of supplements and your timing and everything is just well, good. I think on off like coffee. I've, I've talked uh, with a bunch of sports researchers on stuff like that. So it's super, super, you know, interesting, you know, like um, something like CrossFit is probably better for you to, to have a wide range of physical abilities but really bad for elite level training, right? Because it's taking away from that activity. Whereas something like say an Ironman athlete or a runner or a cyclist is gonna become elite 
doing that exercise but mm -hmm. that isn't going to transfer properly to other exercises yeah like you know my wife um for her age group she won the the bc provincial marathon in 2019 so she's a standing champion right now nice she's training for an iron i could not keep up with her for running for one minute you, you know like there, there's no way right however on a long walk or snowshoeing she can't keep up with me right? <laughs> you know it, yeah. it's very interesting. specific i couldn't finish a marathon if my life depended on it right but yeah. for you know endurance training you know in swimming biking you know and running has not carried over to her having stamina for a long walk or snowshoe interesting yeah so it's good to seasonally i think especially with iron man people triathletes or whatever sport you do to not race like i know people do iron mans every year for years and i started after i had my health breakdown from training and living life yeah. too fast paced that I thought, like, why don't people do it every other year? You know, give your body time to recover, do other sports, other strength training, and get into that, and then go back to endurance. And then that probably is better on your aging process than hammering yeah. yourself every year. Uh, and, and yeah, it's, it's super interesting. We're always curious because I mean, say with something like hiking, if we're going uphill, she's ten times better than a thousand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's just really interesting how how some of these elite trainings lead to huge you know improvements in some areas and yeah. complete deficiencies you know in, in others so it, it, it's quite interesting too. so the benefits of doing the tablets you know are great and then how do people know if it's doing anything what should they you know like you said if it's if people are sleep deprived or brain function yeah. and people are all kind of worried about you know, if they're fasting to take it or not fat, you know, all those little rules people have not yeah, to have anything. So, um, our strongest evidence is from metabolic, but that's going to take a month, two, three months to start seeing the benefit. So people aren't going to get an experiential result. You know, our, our one study was six months, 60 participants, double blind placebo control, and we basically reversed metabolic syndrome. It was wow. effective 18 to 20 parameters, right? Um, our other, you know, we had another study on, on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's very similar to metabolic syndrome in both pre-diabetic states. Um, both of them, about one in three, you know, um, Americans upwards to 40% have either metabolic syndrome, NAPOV, or both, right? So they're, they're very rampant through the population. Correlate um, that with COVID and how many people have died. <laughs> it's yeah, sad. Yeah. It, exactly, because they're some of the biggest risk, risk factors yeah. of serious cases of COVID. Um, you know, so with that, that study on NAPOV, it was just 28 days, right? Double blind placebo controlled crossover. But we saw a significant improvement in liver fat accumulation, a drop in ASP of 10%, and an improvement of insulin sensitivity by 11%. Wow. Right? And so we have a replication study under that that's under, under you know, data review right now. We don't know if it worked or it didn't. We're confident to see it though. Um, those are long term benefits that people start seeing, you know, with their metabolism. Is You're that taking it once a day though? Sorry to interrupt. But uh, twice that, a day. Twice yeah, a day. Okay. Most of them are twice a day. Yeah. Um, two or three times a day. Now um, for immediate benefits, we tend to hear um, our biggest, you know, testimonials are our sleep, right? Like improved sleep outcomes, mm -hmm. um, you know, it improved, uh, you know, wakefulness when you're tired, right? Um, we hear a lot to, uh, on reduced hangovers, you know, and we have a little study that, that's under manuscript prep under hangovers that saw a good result. Um, we hear athletes like, uh, and it's interesting, we've given it to like, you know, some, some like endurance clubs and it seems that the athletes, uh, and, and a, as someone who, who's done Ironman as yourself, you probably know there's some, you know, endurance athletes that start fast and try to hold pace, you know, and slow down over yeah. the race and there's others that know their pace and try and keep their pace you know the entire race so the people who know their pace and try and keep their pace don't seem to report any benefits whereas the people who start fast and try and hold pace say they get incredible improvements in time right because their bodies just hold strong mm -hmm. we hear this a lot you know with with mma fighters and crossfitters which are are 
you know, two of our biggest audiences that endorse us because those are activities where you aren't trying to keep a steady pace, where you're trying to go balls to the wall, you know, an MMA, you're trying to break the other person, right? You know, yeah. trying to outpace them, you know, in CrossFit, you're trying to do as much as possible. Those guys and, and girls tend to say they can hold paces way longer. They're way fresher. They have way more in the tank, right? Um, so we hear that, but universally we hear reduced muscle toners, you know, and we, ha we have one uh, um, clinical trial published using our hydrogen bath tablets that after one bath significantly reduced, reduced uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, you know, both subjectively and by some markers. So that so should help for people as myself, as I said, I'm focused on you know, creating less damage for my workouts. And I know training more than 45 minutes an hour is not healthy for me, but endurance athletes, we are probably going to do that and work out maybe twice a day and do longer workouts on the weekend. So how to mitigate that damage and to work on faster recovery repair, but also, you know, long-term looking ahead, not creating more cellular damage in the future. So this would be something good to implement into your toolbox for how to mitigate damage from workouts, kind of preventative measures. Yeah, exactly. Like both it's going to be helping with the health aspects, you know, mitigating, you know, damage from overtraining, but also, you know, um, depending on how you train and recover, it can improve your performance as well and mm -hmm. speed up your recovery. So you can actually train more without doing damage, right? Which will slowly mean you're going to be performing better as well. Um, you know, if your muscles are, are recovering faster, if you're not as sore, you're going to be able to get in more training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know, you know, what I used to do, I could get away with it for so many years, training 10 of hours a week and already doing an active, busy job and, and not sleeping enough and all that stuff, as you said, you know, it kind of catches up with you. And I think people think they're superheroes for a while, but then you kind of hit the wall or have adrenal exhaustion as I had in 2013, starting all these other symptoms come up that you don't realize are, are part of living life as a race. And so what can we do to take responsibility and ownership of our health now and self-care? So that's kind of my purpose and my mission, help people create awareness, do stuff now like this. So you're not screwed up <laughs> down the road and can't do what you love to do. Yeah, no, if I if I tried to do a day's worth of my workout that I did, you know, six, seven yeah. years ago today, I think I'd be in bed for a week. Yes, I know, right? I mean, it's just, and I hate blaming the aging process. I think people use that as an excuse. I don't think it's because I'm getting older. It's because of what I doing to create imbalance and loss of homeostasis to our body, not having that hormesis, that, you know, acute stress instead of this chronic stress that seems to be <laughs> accumulate through all different sources, external and, and internally. And I, I'm very curious if in both my case and, and you know, my, my best friend and former roommate's case, if we got so sick from whatever hit us because we we're both overtraining so much. Yeah. You no, know, I was training six to eight hours a day um, he was working construction all day long and then going and training two to four hours in the evening. Yeah. Right. So both yeah. of us were overtraining so much that we might have been hit by, you know, a virus that wasn't that bad, but our bodies were so depleted. You see that sometimes in, in uh, you know, high level athletes that are training eight hours a day that, you know, guys get tested and they have the testosterone levels of an 80 year old man because mm -hmm. their body is just completely shut down. We right. call it metabolic chaos. You're creating, you know, imbalances every system of your body, breakdown and burnout, right? Yeah, and you see that in guys in their 20s and guys who haven't used steroids, right? They're yeah. just overtrained, right? So they're they're fatigued, their hormones are off, right? Like all of this stuff is going on. So, you know, I wouldn't want to train like I did seven years ago because it wasn't good for me. You know, like um sorry, my uh <laughs> Kitty cat. So I think it's a, another thing I want to dive into before we run out of time today is your other supplement, because as I said, I'm so focused on improving the aging process and mitochondria damage that we're creating and, you know, looking at chronic stress and how it actually, there's theories of the cell danger response and the mitochondria is really a focus for me that I think we should be more opt 
focus on optimizing and methylation cycle and all what's going on inside. So talk about the other product you guys were launching too, the longevity one. Um, okay, so well, are you talking about uh, the ageless defense? Yes. <laughs> okay, so ageless defense, we, we, uh, we launched that because there was a complete deficiency on the market of anything that, that um, deals with advanced glycation and product crossing, right? Ages, so, it's for short, sure. A-G-E-S. Exactly, <laughs> right? Uh, so we, we myself and uh, with the help of my partner, Dr. Holland, we, we spent about 16 months or something looking at all the natural compounds that have shown to, to you know, either, either stop various ages from forming, you know, break certain ages, you know, and, you know, the, the most prevalent age glucosamine can't be broken as of yet. So all we can do is stop it from forming. Um, or mitigate the damage of them. So we came up with this like master formula, you know, in the right doses and, you know, ingredients that uh, we made ageless defense. Now, what we did first is, you know, it was, it's an unpublished internal study with friends and family. Um, we gave it to, to myself and 19 other people, and we're all, you know, testing it and just monitoring ourselves. Across the board, it, it lowered, you know, blood pressure and blood sugar, right? First and foremost, we're like, okay, you know, that this has some rationale that it could be working for ages. Certainly there's evidence suggesting that it is doing this with ages. So what ages are for your audience, if they're not familiar, there, there are these, basically these bonds that form between, you know, proteins, you know, in, in our body, between our cells and our collagen, like that protein, and there's sugar, right? That, that basically, stiffen everything up so basically the tissues in our body say start off they're 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 strong malleable like a brand new set of sheets right but after time as all these sugars start accumulating in our body uh it's like that set of sheets has been starched out so it's stiff can't be folded properly tears easily all these things now we accumulate these you know cross links all the time, right? It, and it's not just from eating carbs, right? It, it's from cooking proteins or fats, right? So we can get ages that form within our body, right? Through having too high of blood sugar or ones that we eat, you know, from cooking meat and fat or, or carbs, right? You know, basically cooking anything, you know, the browning of a steak, those are ages, right? You know, the browning of a bread, those are ages, right? We can even inhale them them inhaling smoke in the end, right? So there's no way to avoid ages, right? You cannot change your diet and say, I'm not getting ages. No matter what, you're getting ages in various amounts. I mean, I guess you could eat only raw meat and raw food, which could have its own negative consequences itself, but then you're still inhaling ages from smoke in the air, right? So all we can do is kind of fight against them. Now, agents are one of those things that they slowly build up over your life, and then it's too late. You know, vascular stiffening, you know, can lead to, to you know, neurodegenerative diseases, to, to, you know, diabetes, to heart disease, to all these things. It's what causes wrinkles in your face, you know, a, a you know, combination of ages breaking down collagen, and then UV is what causes wrinkles itself, right? So for all these reasons, I mean, it, it could be a contributing factor in sarcopenia makes your, your muscles easier to tear, right? You know, and weaker and more frail. So ages are super destructive. They happen all the time. They're gonna happen. Ageless defense will not stop all of them from occurring, right? But they're, you know, hypothetically, it's gonna be slowing down, you know, them accumulating and, and stopping some of their consequences. Like basically ages contribute to, to you know, shortening telomeres they contribute to increased inflammation they contribute to increased you know oxidative stress and it all happens in this vicious circle you know as one of them starts falling apart it goes around in a circle and everything starts getting dysregulated um so we're actually we currently have a clinical trial underway looking to explore some of the things we saw in our internal study um we continue to get great feedback from consumers self-monitoring themselves on ageless defense we're looking to, to validate this with, you know, a third party independent university that's studying it. Um, then we're gonna go deeper into the research. We're, we're 
really big on research. I mean, I, I don't think I, I touched base on this enough, but um, in four years of being commercial with the hydrogen tablets, we have seven clinical trials published. We have three case studies, one preclinical trial. We have 15 other clinical trials that are underway at various stages. We're working with 12 universities across the world. We have four additional preclinical research programs ranging on you know, various issues from disease models to improve sleep. You know, there, there's so much research underway and coming out. And in all cases, um, we aren't controlling this research. These are universities doing the research. We will donate product. Sometimes we donate funding to strengthen the study. But in all cases, the universities uh, have final, you know, say on what the protocol is and final decision on if they publish results. Well, that's because right? it's not influenced by the people that created it. <laughs> it's natural. Okay. So we believe in free open fair science. Yeah, I think it's it's great to test it out. And if people kind of biohacker world, if you're doing a continuous glucose monitor and like tracking it that way, have you done that? And then like an aura ring to monitor sleep and recovery repair readiness. Have you kind of done those kind of simple biomarkers that people can self-test and measure? I mean, we, we, we get lots of feedback from people on their aura rings. Like actually um, one of our preclinical programs is at a, a top 10 university in the United States and they have their sleep lab. Um, looking at mice, you know, and, and it was because one of the researchers noticed some pretty significant and immediate changes in his own sleep when he started drinking the hydrogen water. So we ended up developing a partnership. Um, they've got a bunch of research that, that's close to being ready to start publishing and showing really strong results. But um, we actually have another clinical trial that's currently underway using aura rings in professional MMA fights, you know, looking at sleep outcomes in the athletes, you know, and then some other subjective markers like muscle soreness and stuff like that. Um, and we have three other clinical trials incorporating sleep questionnaires, right? Okay. So we're looking big on sleep. We get constant feedback, you know, on sleep. Actually, um, our small little hangover study used aura rings also, you know, and we saw some pretty significant results in, you know, the hangover questionnaire results, which is a small little pilot um but also in, in some some of the sleep data for the high high alcohol group right so yeah yeah i think sleep is so essential i've been trying to share articles lately and blog about it and trying to do some podcasts on sleep it just seems like it makes everything else better so i call it the holistic method there's eight elements to transforming the whole youth and then set out to be fit and healthy and that's not just exercise nutrition but sleep and stress management movement throughout the day you know that's your sunrise sunset daylight sun exposure but also digestion and gut health hydration and my eighth one is happiness gratitude play laughter and i think all these elements are so important because if one is off they're all off but the biggest one if you had to pick one i think it's sleep because that's where your body recovers, repairs, detoxification, the internal housekeeping service comes along and just especially makes you feel better. Brain. Especially for our brain too, right? Yeah. right. Our lymphatic system activation, that's kind of like our garbage removal yeah. brain. That's what's activated during sleep, you know, specifically yeah. during REM sleep, right? So, you know, if, if you aren't getting that's good sleep or if you're impairing your REM sleep by, by being intoxicated or taking like sleep meds, it, it's impacting and stopping shutting down the system that removes all the garbage from the drainage yeah um i'm a big believer in no no alarms so yeah me too I go to, thanks I to go, covid i don't have to have an alarm <laughs> well I mean, thanks to working at home i i, yeah. I have to and that's like i have an early morning you know like call like which is maybe once every week or something like there's one that I have to set an alarm for. Yes. But most days I go to sleep when I'm tired and wake up. That's so nice. Big believer in that, right? Yeah. I, I track my aura ring data. I just know. got my aura ring last week. So it's all new experiment. I've wanted one for whenever they started three years ago. And I we finally got one. And then but, we, we've got lots of, uh, of articles I've written. I've written about half a million words of content on our website. Wow. So I've done like retrospective analysis of my own sleep with fasting. Oh, cool. So That's what I'm, I want to write about. Week, you know, everything I, I can, you know, send you links and stuff to, yeah. to look at this stuff. Um, you know, and, and one last thing to touch base on, you know, you mentioned, you know, the gut, the microbiome. 
it, it's again so critical. And like I said, in our microbiome, we, we have hydrogen producing, you know, bacteria and hydrogen consuming bacteria. Mm -hmm. And research across multiple animals, including a couple studies in humans, have all shown that drinking hydrogen water positively impacts the microbiome. So that yeah. could be one of the big reasons for some of the benefits we're seeing. Well, and that's why I've done many podcasts on lab testing and microbiome with Quran. We've done like five episodes on why you should test and not guess because they have a lab test, Biome FX, which you can test out your microbiome. There's also GI map we've done some work with. But, you know, I didn't have key bacteria strains like acromancia. I wasn't even detected. And that's a key one that you need for mitochondria or methylation metabolism is another one, M word. And it's so interesting that you think you're so healthy, but what I want to keep writing and sharing about, like you could do so much better. If this is how you settle, like this is great. When I don't even have these key things in my body and I found out mold toxicity last year, it's like, oh my God, I'm settling. <laughs> you know, there's so much more potential for me, but you don't know unless you test out things and like take hydrogen water, use your aura ring and, and get that data, collect those clues and then figure out how to adjust things. So you're optimizing yourself. And so many um, people don't use that data and take I'm advantage. I'm going to shout out to a not-for-profit I'm starting. It's yeah. not ready, but you can go to their website, myjourney.science. Oh. You know, and there's a no number of us, um, you know, we've got a number of PhDs and MDs on, on the advisory board. We're, we're basically, um, what we're doing is we're creating templates for people to do their own N1 test. So Love I'm it. We're trying to teach tutorials to show yeah. why it's important to biohack, but to do it intelligently. You only <laughs> ever want to try one thing at a time, right? So yeah, you got to test to be able to test. different changes, and then they don't know if something helps or hurt them, right? Yes. So this is just basically, the, basically teaching the basics of science, but then giving these templates that say, okay, I want to try this. You know, and this is a template that it recommends to record outcomes. Now, those outcomes won't be, you know, uh, those outcomes will be tracked. So people will be able to see, well, X therapy worked in 70% of people, but in 10% of people it had side effects because there's a complete uh, lack of, of research on a lot of these, you know, biohacking tools, a lot of supplements, a lot of, you know, medical devices, a lot of biohacking devices. We not only don't know if they work, we don't know if they have side effects. Mm -hmm. We don't know how often they work. We don't know what situations they work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, even with drugs that, that go through sometimes infinitely more testing than supplements, we have not enough post-market analysis to know yeah. what percentage of people are they working, when are their side effects. Researchers are starting to do things like scour Twitter and Reddit, looking for side effects on supplements and drugs. <laughs> We're trying to, to basically put this in, in one resource where we start tracking, you know, and looking things. Then completely optional, people would be able to upload their, their you know, genetic results, right? Yeah. Their DNA results. I was going to say so genetics. That, exactly. And, and this would only be available upon consent, you know, if, if you agree to give it, and only to people from public research universities that want to say, hey, listen, it looks like this works in 60% of people. Can we analyze the genetic reports to see if there's some allele or variant that, that mm -hmm. makes someone susceptible or not susceptible to this, you know, supplement or, or diet or anything yeah. like that? Because, you know, genetic responder studies cost millions of dollars, mm -hmm. right? So we're looking to, to help the research community by crowdsourcing this data. You know, we think that, um, I mean, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of people that use various wearable technology. This is such a wealth of information and we need this information to be utilized so that we can advance our understanding of physiology and advance our understanding of personalized medicine, right? Mm -hmm. And we can only do that with more information. It sounds counterintuitive, but the only way that we can get better personalized medicine is with more general information from a large population. Yeah, I think people can kind of get weird about that. I know with genetics, I always ask my clients, you know, do 23andMe or Ancestry DNA, and then we can upload it to Genetic Genie and you can donate money and you can get so much information or use DNA Fit or if you can, you know, spend more, do strategy. And I think so many people freak out about, 
you know, people are selling their data, even or a ring. I know um, neurohackers, they had an article in that too, that they didn't want to use or rings anymore because they're selling their information. People kind of get worried about that. But I always feel like, well, how are they going to know anything about genetics if we don't share our it, genetic reports? It's not, it's, it's not kind of, to me, I mean, and, and I'm writing a book on, you know, um, how, how a lot of these systems from, you know, research to media to marketing to everything, big data is really killing truth right um right now but all of these things can either be great or harmful depending on execution right so data gathering is not inherently bad it can be great you know it's how it's used right and that's what we need to think about critically right how is this data being used right yeah. is it being used to create an echo chamber so that you hate your neighbor or is it being used so that we can advance healthcare and make everyone happy and healthy? You know, yeah. how is this being used? True, good. Well, we're running out of time, but if we can finish up, just kind of, sh if we can summarize the protocol usage for the hydrogen tablets and the ageless defense, when we should take them and sure. base so the ageless defense is easy, take either four to eight of them um, per day, um, four at once with a meal, right? Okay. Make sure you take it with a meal, all right? um for the hydrogen water it really depends on the individual you know some people like taking first thing in the morning on an empty stomach that's a good protocol um one of my my cutting patents involves hydrogen creates a dense foam with various polysaccharides right mm -hmm. so you know if you eat it with a big meal full of carbohydrates you're actually getting more of a continuous dose rather than acute dose so mm -hmm. don't eat it with a big meal of carbohydrates uh for athletes try and take it 10 minutes before you train, right? Um, or for people working in an office or people who say have lunch and get drowsy after lunch, yeah. try and take it like 1, 2 p.m. when you're feeling drowsy, right? This is some of our biggest anecdotes that it really uh, wakes you up in that situation, you know, and it's, we have clinical evidence on this too. Um, and finally, if you're gonna go, uh, you know, go out drinking, you know, like, or you know put in some substances that are going to make you feel bad the next day take it before you go to bed mm. good yeah i think it's good to experiment and then when to take them and the other thing i was going to ask you put the tap you fill water filtered water and then dump the tablet in or is there like procedures how to do it and then you have to drink it yeah. within a certain amount of time if you let it sit for hours it's not as good what's exactly so basically you want to drink it as fast as you can Right. After it dissolves, so, the tablet yeah. dissolves. So, so put it in anywhere from, you know, um, eight to 17 ounces of water. We recommend room temperature water. You don't want ice cold water. It'll, it'll slow down the reaction and disintegration of the tablet. So, you know, also it's easier to, to drink, you know, room temperature water. It's closer to our body temperature. So it's easier to slam it down. This is not a beverage that you sip, you know, over like an hour or something like that. Mm -hmm. You want to wait until the tablet rises to the surface, breaks apart and then drink it as quickly as you can. So mm. some people, like a lot of our clinical trials say in like, you know, COVID and the elderly, they do eight ounces of water, 250, because that's what they find older people are able to drink in, okay. in one gulp, 250. Personally, I only ever do 500 to 750. So kind of like 16 to 24 ounces, but I can easily guzzle a liter, right? So guzzling 750 milliliters, like it is no issue. Like, or, or for Americans, I can easily guzzle 32 ounces, you know, w without taking a breath. Wow. So, <laughs> so I do that from your previous more. life of drinking alcohol as a Canadian, <laughs> guzzle 32. <laughs> Kidding. So it, I think it's just great to figure out when, how to use it and why and the benefits of it. So hopefully everyone got some tips and where can they learn more and look at the research studies if they're into yeah, kind so of getting to the hrw.com. Okay. You know, we have a big page for hydrogen water, everything hydrogen water from all the research to like, you know, basic questions and stuff. But then uh, if people sign up to our newsletter, not only, um, you know, do we, we have about half a million worth of content so far in the last two years, um, a big chunk of it's by me, but we also have multiple guest writers and they're all either PhDs or MDs, right? Mm -hmm. They're writing about a lot of important topics that people are interested in from, you know, the benefits and shortcuts shortcomings to like genetic testing and microbiome testing like where we have to go you know 
in all these directions, right? So we we put out some really good, well well cited and referenced, you know, mm-hmm. articles. That's great. Well, I'm excited to you know keep taking it myself. I've been you know enjoying it. It actually tastes good too, <laughs> and I like fizzy water. And I love to do anything for the aging process with this ageless defense. So it just has all the ingredients that I always read about that we need. So I was grateful for that to test out. So we'll put everything in the show notes so you guys can try it yourself and see what you think. And we'll uh, follow you guys along on social media. You have. Instagram and Facebook links and just share everything. Now. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your knowledge and your passion and your purpose. No problem. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening to the low carb athlete podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at Debbie You can help us to continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.